Hola, amigos, amigas, pals, bonamis, y assorted other compadres and friends. My name is host Eric. I'm Lauren Cuthbert's fart manager, and also the host of talking to Sup, dumb genius. Sup, indeed. Well, when knowers can't know, I really got to witness how frustrating it is for knowers who can't know last night because Rachel couldn't know whether her wedding dress looked like a bridesmaid's dress. I'm glad to hear. <laughs> you can turn in your log later. <laughs> um, she... You know, she could not know whether it looked like a bridesmaid's dress because she didn't get the answer she wanted from her aunt last night. She didn't get an answer that was answered the question, really. So, when knowers can't know, it's very frustrating to them. And last night, about midnight, uh, I started in there. She started in here. We'd already switched once. And... She came out here to get her wallet. <laughs> I'm like, are you are you are you doing dress shopping right now? <laughs> yes, she was. Of course, the point being, she can't she shouldn't do any more dress shopping or thinking about it until she finds out the answer to that question, right? Like, does her existing dress that she likes, does it look like a bride's face dress. Well, she's trying to solve problems as though she knows the answer to that before she knows it. So like last night when she couldn't find out the answer for real, she asked the tarot cards to tell her about the dresses. <laughs> it's like, as an any dom, I encounter this periodically. I'm thinking about to people about what people are doing like there's no reason to do that because you need to know more information first. I think any doms are good at determining when it's not a good time for any because it's predicated on some future uh, future um, future thing. Uh, yeah, I, I I'm not being a dick about it or anything. I think it's funny mostly. It's like <laughs> I don't get anybody put so much attention into something so <laughs> so silly. I don't know. <laughs> That's just girls. That's just girls in general, man. Girls like some silly ass shit. <laughs> Which is fine. I, you know, it's like I don't I don't want to be with another dude. I, I, I like Rachel's femininity. You know, and that does come with with like what you can only really basically call dumb girl stuff, you know, clothes, makeup. <laughs> uh, well, I think I'm going to wear to the wedding probably this shirt that Winston's mom bought me. She, she knew I was going to need that shirt, so <laughs> she got me a dress shirt, which is nice. And uh, <laughs> well, I understand why this is a very important event for Rachel. I, I definitely do, because I'm part of that story as well as to why it's such an important event. And I articulated some of that last night. But um, how do you get over unrequited love? I don't think I've ever been in that situation. I think I always looked first for if a girl was interested in me. You know? Maybe if I pull her too, it's like I, uh, 
I don't have feelings for somebody until after I get to know them, I guess. Try being more selfish, Lauren Cuthbert. Try remembering, hey, other people don't matter. The only person who matters is Lauren Cuthbert. Without me, there'd be 10% less methane in the atmosphere. And then what would we do? <coughs> <clears throat> Six in the morning, police at my door. BBS equals Bobby Sun. Have you sorted your dress, Eric? Um, what is that uh, answer to, Boba Fett? I did read the thing wrong about the execution of the plan. It was very cringe. Talk about imagination around wild. Huh. I don't know what you were talking about. Or you know what, Winston's mom? Here's here's the best solution on required love. Run right up to the guy that you love a lot and kick him in the nuts. It's worth a try. I think that might requite your love. <laughs> oh, that's what you get, fuck, fuck, tard, for not loving me. Well, more of that. Can you share some tips on consuming weed? I'll try it for the first time next September when I'm back at uni. Well, yeah, I would say if you're in a foreign land. You might be handed what's called a spleef, which is half tobacco, half weed. That is not the way. That is not the way to smoke weed. I, I don't know what the Europeans are thinking. Don't do it that way. You just put, get a bong, a regular bong, like a, probably a smaller bong than this one. You probably don't have God's own lungs like me, so maybe this one is better for you. Um, and you just put a little bit of weed in the bowl here and put some water in the bong. Not too much water. Okay. This is a big problem with, with bongs is there's a tendency to put too much water in it. And then you get bong kisses. And nobody likes bong kisses. Bong kisses are when, like, this is a little bit clogged. And so I pull, pull a little bit harder and then it finally pops through and then pew, splashes bong water in my mouth. You don't want that to happen. So you just nice and slow. And of course, <coughs> if you've never smoked it before, <coughs> It'll probably make you cough your brains out. Yeah, now, if you are going to smoke a joint, smoking a joint is perfectly fine way to smoke weed. But be warned, if somebody hands you a joint and you're not in America, it might have half tobacco in it. I I mean, what can you say? The Europeans, they love David Hasselhoff and they smoke joints wrong. Who knows why? The idea of mixing marijuana with tobacco is so dumb. Now, I will make one exception to that. I, I like smoking an occasional blunt. But, um... <coughs> yeah. Your eyes are big, already big. I'm in an eye dome. <coughs> I 
the French love Jerry Lewis. Do they smoke marijuana wrong? Well, loving Jerry Lewis is probably even worse than smoking marijuana wrong. Jerry Lewis was not funny. He was never funny at all. And what was even less funny were his goddamn telephones. Okay. And his so-called kids, Jerry's kids, like none of those were his actual kids. There were other people's children. He was just trying to claim them for his own. Hey, do you have a mentally retarded child? I'm Jerry Lewis. It's mine now. That's Jerry Lewis for you. Not a funny guy. Not at all funny. Why did he have a big career and stuff? He was never funny at all. That makes me mad. When bad comedy is successful, it makes me mad. It's like, it's not okay. It's not okay for anybody to like that horrible shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's so, like, overwrought. It's so slapsticky and, like, big facial expression. He's like, Jim Carrey meets Charlie Chaplin. Complete fucking disaster of failure. Huey Lewis, I'm fine with. <laughs> Huey Lewis, both him and the news are fine with me. I've got no problem with Huey Lewis. I liked several of their songs. I was quite quite a Huey Lewis in the news fan back in the day when, when they had a couple of hit singles. At least I was a big fan of their singles, not really of... Uh, I didn't buy their album or anything, but um, so yeah, I don't have any problem with Huey Lewis. I don't have any problem with the news, and I don't have any problem with Huey Lewis and the news. But I do have a problem with Jerry Lewis. At least he's dead, though. Jerry Lewis is dead, so he no longer has to. He no longer gets to force us to endure his stupid telephones. If you've ever watched a Jerry Lewis telethon. You must have been being kept prisoner somewhere. Now, what's interesting, when I talk about Andy Rooney, I'm talking about the guy on 60 Minutes who say things like, like the, the one that went his mom linked to work. Where did all these kitchen gadgets come from? Thanksgiving's coming up, and I went through the kitchen and collected some of these. Now, what is this? It's a melon baller. I guess when we bought it, we thought we'd ball melons. I've never once balled a melon. I'm Andy Rooney. Uh, that guy. But there's also this other Andy Rooney, who's from a long time ago, who was a child star around the same time that Judy Garland was a child star. And in fact, um, uh, I never formally typed him. I do think he's an NTP for sure, but he could possibly be an INFJ. So, um, that was really good, by the way, Winston. I, that was one of my favorite Andy Rooney things I've ever seen. I don't even know what this is, but we have two of them. <laughs> he has all these shit on his desk, and he's just like, now here's an interesting item. This is for beating corn into wheat. We neither beat corn nor wheat. Why do I have it? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, the old Andy Rooney, he was part of what I refer to now as the Judy Garland special. The Judy Garland special is downers at night, speed in the morning. <laughs> That's how they got the, the old Andy Rooney, not the Andy Rooney from 60 Minutes, but it was his first name, Andy, too. You know which Rooney I'm talking about, right, Winston's mom? 
who was like same era as Judy Garland, uh, big star. That was Andy also, right? Wasn't it? Mickey Rooney, my bad. That's Mickey Rooney. Well, Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, when the studios needed them to work a lot on the, the hectic uh, work schedule of the studio, of course, they're children and, you know, they don't necessarily want to be performance slaves. But back in the day, there were very few child labor laws and stuff that would protect them. So, um, what the studio executives did and their managers did is uh, um, he's an interesting guy. One time he wanted to show me some of his ideas about cognitive functions. Uh, they were different than mine and also non-conflictatory. Uh, I didn't have anything I couldn't find anything to critique about what he presented me, which is unusual. So probably an NTP. So yeah, what they do is they'd give, uh, they'd give Andy Rooney and well, not Andy Rooney, Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland speed in the morning. So they'd work all day and then they couldn't go to sleep at night. So they'd give them like, you know, Valium or uh, whatever, whatever the equivalent to benzos were back then. I don't know what they had, but they'd give them some kind of downers for for nighttime, and then they wouldn't be able to get up in the morning, so they'd give them more speed. <laughs> it's like no wonder, at least. Um, Judy Garland, if it turned out so fucked up, you know. I guess Mickey Rooney seemed to turn out fine, though. I don't remember really hearing him complaining uh, about it. Yeah, he, I, he's been around for uh, quite a while now. I've seen him occasionally around here, and he does his own stuff. And uh, interesting guy. Very, very uh, ideationally savvy and art savvy. Definitely an interesting fellow. But, um, and, a, and a good, a good sort of viewing tip to everybody. I agree, Boba Fett. <laughs> However, I tend not to consume the same kind of stuff I do, you know? So, it's like, I think he does a good job in my, in a similar niche to me. Um, I'm capable of being a good, good analyst of other NTP's work, but I'm not generally inclined to consume it. I mean, unless it's comedy, maybe. Like, I don't like non-intuitive comedy at all. Non-intuitive comedy just makes me go, bleh. Well, if he is NI as fact, that could be INTP who's demonstrative NI. He could be, like I said, originally an INFJ. I I I have him narrowed down to three possible types. ENTP, INTP, INFJ. I don't really think he's an ENTP though, because I I think he's is much he's more careful than an ENTP would be. You know, salmon, asparagus, and mashed potatoes for breakfast. Ew, salmon. Yeah, I'm not an analyst design to be. In not a super long time, I'm going to have to go poo. I can feel it. I can feel it brewing. 
It's a brewing in my butt, it's a brewing in my butt, it's a brewing in, it's a gonna come out and go into the toilet, yes, one of these days, yeah, 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 hopefully soon. You know, if I have too much poop in me, it really kind of, uh, like, affects everything, you know? Like, I, I feel... Okay, so I'm just going to start this new pot of coffee, then I'm going to go in and poo. I said to myself, Eric, why not poo before the live stream? I thought, well, I don't quite really need to poo yet. My pronouns are I and me. Your pronouns that you use to refer to me are your business. That's a thing, right? People say, like, my preferred pronouns are he and him. No, they're not your, your preferred pronouns. Your preferred pronouns are I and me. Your preference for other people's pronouns are he and him or she and her. You know? I've challenged C.S. Joseph to a boxing match. I've also challenged Michelle Shock to a songwriting contest. Okay? Um, but I think I think it's important to remember that next time somebody says their preferred pronouns are me and me, you go, no, they're not. Their preferred pronouns are I and me. Let's be objectively correct about that thing. Their preferred pronouns are I and me. That's what they use to describe to themselves. To refer to themselves. Have you ever heard that response? That's such a great response. All these people talking about uh, transgender stuff and pronoun types, have you ever heard anybody make that argument? Have you ever heard anybody make that response? When somebody says, well, their preferred pronoun is, is he or him. Have you ever heard anybody respond, no, it's not. Their preferred pronouns are I and me. Even though that's the only correct response. I've never heard it either. It didn't occur to me until Rachel started asking me all these questions. But how critically important is that to the question? So next time you hear somebody say that, correct them and say, no, no, that's not. That's not their preferred pronoun. Their preferred pronouns are I and me. So we, we make it clear what's actually happening. You know, it's not that they have a preference for pronouns. They have a preference for how you talk. And you can see how powerfully the right words change the conversation, right? It's like, this is why we have to use words correctly. Because the right words change the conversation in the right way. And the wrong words allow misconceptions to occur. The wrong words allow people to persist in claims that make no sense at all. Like that a person has their preferred pronouns being words that other people use. And the thing that's so funny about it is it's obviously factually incorrect as soon as you think it through a bit, but nobody did. Nobody did. If that's not their preferred pronouns, that's a lie. Their preferred pronouns are I and me.
Okay, I'm going to poo now. Dad, back. Did you miss me? <sighs> Feel a lot better. A lot better. I'm sorry. <laughs> I ruined the, the peace and quiet, huh? With my incessant blather. <clears throat> Creaky door sounds. Okay, so Podelius, to prepare you for your eventual smoking of marijuana you plan to do, 
I'm going to transubstantiate this bong rip to you. So you'll get a heads up now about what it feels like before you actually smoke it. Because when I transubstantiate a bong rip, what that means is that my lungs do all the work, but your head gets all the effects. So sit down. If you're driving, pull over to give you a heads up about what it's going to feel like. I hereby transubstantiate this bong rip to Fodelius. Fodelius. AKA Suda. You really NB as you said in the post. I mean, it's important to remember that the people have agent, subject, object perspectives. So on the question of sex, the agent perspective, knowing what you are, is arbitrary because you're knowing yourself. So it's subjective data. On the subject side, it's affect projection, which is to say, uh, I would like others to treat me as though I were what I'm projecting to be. Now, we all know in life that this happens all the time in all sorts of different ways, and that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, as far as being an object, other people's perceptions of gender and stuff, well, that's not within our control, obviously. What functions, what function likes the feeling of the burn when doing exercises? I mean, maybe SI, you know, it's like, my dad has always exercised and still exercises. He's still at 80, whatever. I'll catch him out in the garage uh, curling his little fairly small weights now as he's gotten older. But, uh, and doing push-ups on the, the railing along the steps by the door, pushing towards the concrete so it doesn't, you know, doesn't put stress on the on the ruling railing se tool loves the burn uh, se tool would make sense too si tool makes sense too because it's se6 you know se6 I think SE6 has the best follow through of any types. ESFJs and ESTJs have the best follow through. The reason is they use their SI tool to keep track of their personal plans and stuff all the time. And then they use demonstrative SC to follow through on them. Um, since their plans are subject to actions anyway, it's like using SE as a subject just sort of naturally makes sense. And I don't know. I, I just see, I saw in both my ESFJ ex-wife and in my ESCJ dad, uh, a complete sort of lack of imagination when it comes to Switching things up at the last minute, right? They, you know, there's not a fondness for spontaneity, really, in those types. Why? Because there's any is selfish. They're the only ones who want to be spontaneous on their terms and their frame of reference. And, you know, counter-value to SE means 
they don't like spontaneity from the agent perspective. They use the follow through part of SE, not the spontaneity part. Um, what about having an, a routine for exercise and adding new ones? Would that be SI because it's keeping track of the exercise routine? Well, I don't know about the adding new ones part. Uh, you know, my dad's always worked out. He goes to the gym. He he used to go jogging a lot. Um, then he rode, rode his bike a lot. Uh He's very conscious about taking care of himself SI wise. Uh, when he started putting on some weight, he went on a diet. He's still on this diet, which means basically he just eats like fish and chicken occasionally instead of meat. Um, You know, it's like I, I'm envious in a lot of ways of, of people with SI higher in the stack because they, they're so much more grounded, you know, and they just, well, they don't try to reinvent the wheel, you know, and Unfortunately, you know, it's like my relationship with my physical space is that <laughs> what's Vermeyer? If I take up some SE option, like a certain vitamin plan, I'm trying to eat yogurt, I can only do this for six weeks. Right. The thing about being an S SI dom is if you're, if you're in a good place in life where you're happy with the things that you do routinely and you, I see, and you routinely uh, enjoy doing those same things and anticipate them. It's like, see, that's the thing. And that side dom anticipates the various things they're going to enjoy doing during the day and the various things that are going to stress them out. You know, like, oh boy, I can't wait to go home and putter in the garden after this or whatever they plan to do. And then we're gonna go home. I'm gonna listen. We gotta put. I'm gonna put Vinny on the radio. My mom would say, you know, meaning she gonna listen to the Dodgers. Put Ben Scully on the radio, and uh, and I'm gonna just putter in the garden. It's just gonna be so nice. And then she'd do exactly that. Whereas with me, it was always like, what do I want to do when I get home? If if I was into something, then I'd be like, I can't wait to get back to that video game or something that I was playing. But if not, it was just a general sense of, I can't wait to be able to play freely without constraint and without anything more specific than that, you know? <laughs> That's funny, Nicola. I'm going to remove it, though. <laughs> Just because we don't want to trigger any YouTube YouTube things that may not be able to tell a joke from, from something serious, you know. Uh, I mean, I'm really I was really struck by uh, nothing to apologize for. Not your fault at all. I'm saying I don't know if the YouTube algorithm can is smart enough to not freak out over that. So I'm just gonna remove it. Um, 
I was, I was just kind of tripped out by Rachel's uh, Monday laundry thing. So, you know, she has her schedule where she does the laundry on Mondays. She does it every Monday consistently on Monday. And if she misses the Monday, she'll do it the following Monday. Now, this is a very, you might say, well, that's very uh, SI, isn't it? Consistent, doing it the same day. That's not SI. That's not really SI. That's more like SITE stuff. So an SI person, um, like an ISFJ, doesn't think much further ahead than today and tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Uh, for step further ahead than that, they have it on a calendar. But while they aren't, they aren't so necessarily likely to have a specific day as they are to um, kind of just continually do little cleaning things and stuff until they think they're done and then go on to their comforts whether it's watching certain shows or drinking a cup of coffee or whatever. <sighs> NTJs are really into being consistent too. They're constantly changing themselves, but don't want to portray themselves as an ever changing possibility. Well, th from that perspective, they're improving themselves. So they, they're consistent about their plans to improve themselves, probably, especially ENTJs. INTJs, I don't know how much of that self-improvement stuff there really is. Their third slot F5 makes them, in some sense, more reasonable because they're... Uh, they're a lot less prone to seek and seize external symbols of, yeah, you know? Well, Rachel cracked this beer last night and uh, left it on the counter near the bathroom, barely drank, so I uh, might as well finish it. One of the advantages of non-alcoholic beer is you can have it for breakfast. <laughs> yeah. Well, Rachel and I have adopted a very simple lesson with my dad, which is leave things exactly as you found them. Because uh, what might make perfect sense to me is just going to result in questions about was I the one who moved that thing or did that thing? <clears throat> Sometimes I've gotten in trouble for throwing away expired shit, right? Like, ah, uh, you need to respect other people's property, Eric. But, Dad, it's like three weeks expired. Do you really want to keep that? Uh, it's not yours, son. Okay, my bad. My bad. I won't touch any of your shit. <laughs> I just won't touch your shit at all, okay? <laughs> right, well, I gotta say, my dad, uh, my dad was never, and was never cold to Rachel, but uh, 
he's he seems to have warmed to her more even than before, which is to say, you know, when we went to visit my mom the other day, he made note of how much my mom enjoys seeing Rachel and seems to recognize Rachel and remember her more than me or my dad even, you know? Uh, so, and, and I think, you know, just she's been around long enough now that his SI has come to know this is the reality now. It's like he, he doesn't, he, he probably is very hesitant to invest invest uh, faith in any given woman of mine because none of them ultimately have lasted, right? But with SI second, that NI reality gets overwhelmed by the SI reality fairly quickly, you know, and those sort of larger truths don't seem to weigh on him very much. Um, he's, you know, to the, whenever we do stuff with my mom, especially he, he's very warm to Rachel for him, his kind of warm, you know, as I said to Rachel the other day, like when he was sort of waxing poetic about how excited my mom was to see her. I said, that's his way of saying I love you. <laughs> Are there clear differences between front and rear stack functions regardless of the position of the stack one through four? Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm talking about right now. Like, the thing is, you got to think of the two same kinds of functions as being a relationship of that on that function spectrum. So the relationship between any and SE is talk about what to execute versus execute. So your where your any and SE are is going to have is going to define your relationship with that. One of those things is going to be conscious. And one of those things is going to be unconscious, more or less. Um, six slot is our most conscious, unconscious function. And I think eight slot is our least conscious, unconscious function. So there's, there's varying degrees of consciousness. But um, the thing is, so with any and SE, it's like, talk about it. Talk about what to execute. Execute. Um, you're going to be somewhere on that continuum. Oh, I'm way over here towards execute and against talk more about how to execute. That's like Trump. Talk is cheap. We don't need to talk about anything. We just need to do shit, you know. Um, and that's maximally territory uh, skew on the SE any spectrum. Uh, whereas maximal maximal well, I mean, I guess the maximal skew would be ISFP because maximal skew in terms of NESE is going to be uh, probably INFP, maybe INTP. What's my dad's an Egram? I think he's a uh, three... Eight, 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 three, seven. I think he's a mover shaker type, as they call him. What I used to think I was, I used to think I was a mover shaker when I was more, more explicitly successful. You don't believe polars are real? <laughs> well, Fodelius, you've never asked an ESFP logic questions. Ask an ESFP or an ENFP some basic logic questions and you'll believe in polar. Ask an ENFJ or an ENTJ some basic details about what you did yesterday questions and you'll believe in polar. 
Here's what happens when you ask an ESFP the following question. If you say, who is my mother's sister? They'll say, family? That's polar, T.I. If, if you say, if all magpies eat cheese and I'm a magpie, do I necessarily eat cheese? They might say, well, I mean, you could be maybe a magpie who doesn't like cheese. And you go, okay. That's some TI poor. If you are talking about what makes you think you TE? One of the things to remember about your polar is you're constantly mistaking it for something else and something else for it. So I used to, until I got very meta aware, mistake my FI for SI. So, you know, before I knew about cognitive functions, it was quite likely someone, I'd be very sad or whatever, and someone would say, how are you feeling, Eric? I'd say, fine. I don't know, maybe a little hungry. It, you know, it, because I wouldn't get that there was this emotional component I was supposed to pay, pay attention to as well, you know. I never thought I had, I used to, it, I used to, I told you your TE was better than polar. Oh. And then I typed you as an INFJ. Well, I mean, the thing is, you, your TE tested better than polar, but I think I gave you one TE test. Um, and... It's certainly possible that there's also that one test for misleading or anomalous or something. Um, okay, so an ENFP mistake SI for TI. How does that work? Okay, well, you say this universal rule, but justify it. And then they give examples from their life of it being true. That's not a TI justification. That's an SI justification. Proof by example is not proof at all, right? Yeah, I, I would say, I would say you were as well, you know. Does an ENFJ, ENFJ work or how can it work? In my opinion, Colin Bowles, which is based purely on my own experience, really. Uh, I, I know from my experience, I don't find other ENFPs attractive. Like, I don't find ENFP women attractive. Um... There's a sort of incestuousness about it, but it may not be the case for other types. I don't know. If you have TI, is logic personal for you? Well, remember, logic is something that's always used by a person, um, but it, it's not the case that a person always uses logic. So in answering this question, I am personally using logic which is a universal way of validating um, to answer your question. Does that mean that my logic is my own personal logic? No, it's the universal logic, but I personally am using it. I'm a person who prefers to use the universal logic over the subjective logic, which is logic, which is FI logic. And that's another example of this continuum thing. So if you look at TI and FI, it's you're somewhere on a continuum of uh, interested calculus and disinterested calculus. Um, so an interested calculus and a disinterested calculus do not necessarily conflict with each other, uh, but they certainly can. And they're a fundamentally different way of deciding what's 
good, true, correct, validated. Do you mean that in the way that a TI user might feel responsible for being correct? Well, TI users do feel responsible for being correct. They feel that they are appropriately subject to correction when they are incorrect. Uh, whether if they're strong TI users, then they, uh, they probably aren't going to have a big problem with being corrected because it's not going to happen very often and they expect that that's what's going to happen. You know, if they're a weak TI user, then um, they're going to feel kind of insecure about TI and maybe run from TI. I can give you an example of a fourth slot TI person running from TI from when I visited Horse Mumbler in Arizona. So I left the hotel very early in the morning, like three in the morning, two in the morning, because I wanted to get an early start to get home. Uh, it was a long drive back, right? So the only place that was open was Waffle House. I stopped in there. And the lady was making this mistake. She's supposed to charge um, a 15% surcharge for takeout that basically is the tip for the waiters and waitresses since uh, I'm not sitting down and leaving a tip, right? So, uh, but this girl was clearly an ESFJ and she, she kept adding 115%. So my bill was like six dollars, and <laughs> or, let's just make it uh, five dollars to make the math easier. So it was supposed to be then a seventy-five cent uh, a charge, but she was making it ten dollars and seventy-five cents. So she was adding the five dollars again for some reason, and so I was trying to explain to her, um, listen. <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> but she did not want to hear my explanation or learn from what I was saying at all. She instead, even though it was the middle of the night, kept calling her supervisor over and over and over again, increasing with increasing franticness, because she had a, a set of instructions that she was following on a piece of paper, and she kept following it and kept following it and kept producing this answer that was not acceptable. And she tried it like five times. Um, I don't know what it said on the set of instructions, but somehow it, the set of instructions made her add another five dollars to it. So, uh, you know, I was trying to be as patient as I could and as nice as I could, and I said, "Look, they the, the correct amount is five seventy-five, okay? You know, um, and and the, but eventually she talked to her." her supervisor on the phone and supervisor said, yeah, he, he's right. It's 575. And, and she came up to me with, you know, like tears in her eyes. And I was like, it's okay. It's okay. You know, but the thing is fourth slot TI it's conscious, but she doesn't like to rely on it to accomplish anything. So, um, it's, uh, She she preferred to use her her eight slot function in that case, which is TE, or her tool function or her dominant function with FE, which is ask somebody else, right? So first she tried her TE eight slot function, which is to, to just follow the instructions to the letter again and again and again and try to get different answers. Uh, and then she tried the FE approach, which is call her boss because she just didn't trust her TI not to get fooled, you know? I was obviously not trying to fool her, but she should have trusted her Effie and read me as somebody who was not trying to fool her. But I, I think, you know, she understands that, that that's not a good answer to your boss if they're busting your chops about something. Okay, well, the math we were talking about, though, is not complicated math, right? It's percentages. It's adding 15% to a bill. Well, yeah, because ENFJs don't like to have their fourth slot TI exposed. Unlike ESFJs who 
who fit the normal standard of um, of being somewhat self-deprecating about their fourth slot TI. So ENFJs like to project as intelligent more than ESFJs do who are comfortable with projecting as down to earth or something, you know? So a lot of times they'll rattle off some some TE stuff uh, or some facts they know about things as sort of a pantomime of TI. Good fourth TI, not like watching stuff they disagree with because they don't trust themselves not to get wrongly convinced or something. That seems plausible. Second slot TI doesn't like watching stuff that they disagree with because it makes them mad. What's the best McDonald's order? Money is no object. A Big Mac and a quarter pounder and a large fries or a small fries is just for me and a large Coke. No pickles on either the Big Mac or the quarter pounder. Get rid of those pickles. Just throw them in the trash. Where do I find ISTP women? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Good question. Uh, bar, maybe? I don't know where ISP women hang out. Well, okay. Rain, that that might be fine. Like, I don't mind watching something, expecting it to be meow, and then realizing, hold on a second. I agree with you. It has to be sufficiently hard. You have to catch somebody in some sophisticated bullshit. But then again, I don't necessarily want to spend all the time it's going to take to explain why the sophisticated bullshit is, is bullshit. And there's not always a, a quick and easy explanation. It's like, it's so important to find the NI phrase that provides direction or clarification. So like with COVID, the phrase that was lacking at the beginning was let it run its course. That was the alternative that needed to be stated. Let it run its course. But you never heard anybody say that. So there was no alternative stated. And so it wasn't in the public sphere that there was an alternative. <sighs> Is the troll from the troll problem hot? Uh, no, it's a big 12 foot troll with spiny spikes on its skin that form a tough armor. And it's got webbed hands and feet and it's green and it lives in the water. Oh, you find that hot? Well, you know, then yes. Then yes, that river troll is hot. Um, but can you seduce the troll from the troll problem? Well, the troll from the troll problem is interested in troll women. And he will make a deal with you if you can find him a troll woman. I've never had anybody actually go successfully execute that plan because the deal he offers isn't very good. He just offers to, to only take 7% of your food instead of 10% if you get a troll woman, which doesn't really solve the problem. So for him, a troll woman is only worth 3% of his take. I guess it would be 30% of his take. Uh, 
and that's totally fine. If you so if there's anybody who wants to get typed but doesn't want to be published, there's uh, no problem with that. Uh, a lot of people do that, and that's fine. Well, you got a point there, Fodilis. Uh, if you do find him a female troll, pretty soon you might have a whole family of trolls there. Except, here's the deal. Uh, trolls don't make families like that. So, the troll woman would leave after getting impregnated and give birth, raise the troll baby until it's a troll adolescent. Then it would go off and need to find its own territory. Yeah, Tahabi, exactly. Uh, no, that rarely happens. Oh, it's today Mem Memorial Day? Today's not Memorial Day. Today's Wednesday. Yeah, not a bad idea. Yeah, I don't have anything scheduled at the moment. And I could uh, definitely use the money. What sort of situation do you think would push a second slot TI type to have a temper, tan temper tantrum? The last real temper tantrum I had was very early in COVID when I went into a 7-Eleven with my shirt up because I didn't, I'd forgotten the mask, of course. And being told that um, next time, if I didn't have a mask, I wouldn't be given any service. And I said, I have a face covering, which is what your sign says, you know. And she didn't want to listen to me and blah, 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 blah. And I threw a little timber tantrum and pounded my hand on the, the counter. And then got in a big argument with a guy outside. Because it was just so fucking irrational. Seeing as I'm an anime enjoyer, do you play video games too? If so, would you stream them sometime? I have streamed a couple of games in the past. I don't really play video games. Um, I used to play Madden when I had a PS3. Well, I mean, I think it should be as it is, Rain, where uh, you have to answer questions on your driver's license that says whether you want to have your organs donated or not. Some people don't want to. Some people have opinions in life that their what happens to their body after death matters a lot. Some people don't, you know. I I'm on your side. I don't. I don't think that it matters what happens to your body after you die, but uh, a lot of people believe differently, I guess. Yeah, I watched Attack on Titan. I've watched all four seasons. Or what if it's an underage person? Well, I mean, I don't think that they should have any less right to dictate what happens to their body after their death than anybody else. Granted, they'll probably be just voicing their parents' opinion, but it's just something we got to deal with as a as a reality until they are of their majority. That five bullshit arguments followed by escaping the debate. Right. That'll piss me off, too. Not answering my questions pisses me off. 
it's like when I ask a question and somebody tries to avoid answering it, like consciously, it doesn't want to answer it. So they answer some other question, like think that's going to fool me or something. I am immediately pissed off. I was like, okay, answer the question I asked, please. Not the question you wanted to answer. Um, I see. So for somebody who's never filled out those forms, what should we assume? Um, I would guess that it's we I, at that point we can assume that they're you can use their organs. If nobody ever filled out any answers about it or voiced any preference, I would be personally okay with operating under the assumption that we can use their organs. I think that makes sense. You know, it's like if you feel strongly enough about it, then you can't indicate that somewhere and then we'll respect your wishes. And if you don't, and then we should be able to take your organs. I mean, you know, assuming you're dead. <laughs> assuming you're dead. Not, not if you're still alive. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's a hobby. Uh, you just described every fucking horrible encounter I've ever had in my life. Somebody says something stupid. I point out it's stupid or ask some questions. They ignore my questions, don't answer them, make some other bullshit argument. And you go, um, can you please answer my question? And they go, oh, calm down there, buddy. You're getting a little too emotional here. It's like, okay, okay. What I'm going to do then is at lunch, I'm going to do what you just did to me. I'm going to go up to you and spit in your food and then go, when you get upset about it, I can say, whoa there, buddy, what's the problem? I'm just spitting in your food. I mean, you're spitting in all of our faces with your stupidity. So it would be absolutely equivalent. Would you like that? You know, straw man fallacies make you upset, Rebecca. I mean, people straw man all the time. A straw man that's upsetting is is one that is just a it's a variant of not answering my question, you know? So if I'm making arguments and you answer weaker arguments than the ones I've made, you're just doing a variation of not answering my questions, not being honest, you know? Honest people answer my questions, even if they don't know where I'm going with them, with, the, with a simple answer, because they want the truth, not they want to win. Lord, I was born a rambling man. Yeah, right. I, I, those things are it's very annoying when people do that. It's like, if you want to use words and talk with me about ideas, then be a reasonable person. Don't be a bag of poo. Nobody wants a bag of poo. Here, have this bag of poo. Wait, I don't want that bag of poo. That's basically all I'm saying. Is don't be a bag of poo. Is that fair? Am I being unreasonable to ask that? Good for you, Adrian B. Um, I'll tell you, if you were to ask me, though, my basic pet peeve, what it is, it's very simple. It's much simpler than, than anything like that. It's leaf blowers. I cannot stand fucking leaf blowers. 
I hate the sound of them. I hate the fact that that they that they can be heard from like five houses away. Long-winded people. <laughs> what in the world are you doing here, John John Doe? I just cannot stand the leaf blowers. They're so loud. The pitch is right in the listener frequency fatigue range. They're super loud. Uh, they interfere with my conversations. They interfere with my recordings and live streams. And the other thing is they're very, very poorly scheduled. So it's like, it seems like this whole neighborhood all around me has their, their gardener scheduled in, you know, like every two hours, every day of the week, so I mean, before everybody goes and gets their shit done. Lawn mowers are not as bad. They're a lower pitch. Leaf blowers, it specifically has to do with both the incredible loudness of them, the gasoline-powered ones, which they're incredibly loud, but also the, the pitch. <laughs> It's like right at 3,000, you know, in the frequency range. And it's just like, ah, fuck. I hate leaf blowers. <laughs> Nicola says they're nice. <laughs> Are you talking about leaf blowers, Nicola? It's, they're out to get me. It's a lame version of the Truman Show. <laughs> Lawn mowers don't sound nearly as bad. They're much lower frequency. Um, they're not nearly as bothersome. You know, obviously, smoking gore in your face who smokes gore? <laughs> like some blood and guts at a murder scene or something? Ooh, pack me a bowl of that. <laughs> My biggest pet peeve is when people attack the person instead of the idea. I couldn't give a sh Less of a shit if someone is crazy or working on earth, you should give every judge. I agree with you, beautiful Duang, so much. That warms my heart to hear you say that. It warms my heart like an ice cold beer on a cool Christmas morn. Oh, yeah, that's annoying. Mom, mom, mommy, mom, 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 mom. Mom, mom, mom. <laughs> do they do that to you, Rebecca? <laughs> do they play? Mom, mom, mom. Mom, mom, though. Mom, but mom, mom. Mommy. I'm glad I only have one kid. You know, it's like... I don't think... Uh, I think if I had two kids, this is just a random thought. I, maybe it's not true at all. But I feel like if I had two kids, I'd be less close to both of them than if I had one kid. I only have that much... I only have a limited amount of emotional closeness. And they'd have to share <laughs> if I had two kids. But probably, you probably don't feel like that, Rebecca, huh? You probably think if I had a second kid, I wouldn't feel like that. <clears throat> I'm the only child of an only child. My mom's an only child as well.
Well, that's the other thing is leaf blowers are a slightly more efficient way to move leaves than a rake, but not much. The thing that makes them more efficient is that sometimes you can get underneath shit and get the leaves out where it's going to be hard to get it with a rake. But, um, you're <laughs> an only a good leaf floor makes a difference uh, yeah I mean I, I'm not disputing that it's more efficient but it's like why are we so why are we so determined to empower the gardeners we hire to use whatever technology they want to garden at the expense of the neighborhood's comfort. It's like if I started a new hi Ike OG on the end, INTJ, um, You don't have as much emotional closeness, but they can compensate by their sibling relationship, so it's fine, I guess. I really am happy with the with the uh, relationship I have with my daughter. Um, we're very tight, and. It is illegal to park your own car, your car on your own lawn in many, many neighborhoods. Uh, and that's because it's not really, it's because like homeowners associations and stuff, it's more than laws, really. There's maybe municipal laws, but it, you know, it depends where you are. It's like, Basically, in the neighborhood where I live, it's got a very strict homeowners association. Uh, and you have to agree to join the homeowners association before you buy here. So they've got a lot of stuff like that that you, they don't want things looking trashy. Like if you let your yard go to shit, you'll come get yelled at by the homeowners association. <laughs> Is jaywalking enforced anywhere in the U.S.? Um, I doubt it. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've never heard of anybody actually get a jaywalking ticket. See ya. <laughs> Ike, OG, Amin, I love your shaming tactic. <laughs> it's absolutely fantastic. Um... Thank you very much, Ike. You're a gentleman, a scholar, and a reader of fine literature. People who like to give adv advice when you don't even ask for it and literally lecture you. How fascinating is it to watch your kids grow up? I absolutely love the simplistic way kids process information. It's like watching a primitive car to understand how the complex contemporary cars work. Yeah, Sheila W., I agree with you there. My favorite all-time so sound is Delilah laughing as a little girl or a, a baby. Uh, it was absolutely the most delightful sound you could ever hear. And uh, it's still delightful. You're making me verklimp, Sheila. I don't like thinking back about Delilah when she was little. It makes me feel nostalgic or something. I don't know what it makes me feel. It's not nostalgia. It's uh, what emotion am I feeling right now? I'm not sad, but I'm cryy. 
What emotion is that? Anybody know? PMS. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent joke, Zareen. Excellent joke. Pride? Huh. Yeah. I think you nailed it. No, I think I think Ike nailed it. I'm proud of my daughter. These are Japanese pride tears. It happens a lot in anime when the uh, the hard struggling hero succeeds, and um, and then people who who uh, like that person, yeah. Here comes the waterworks. It's a weird thing to feel cry about, though. Pride, right? But that's, that's exactly right. I did just meet the new boy, Mia. Winston's mom, let's not, let's not jump ahead of the game here. He's not officially her boyfriend, okay? He's her boy, Mia. <sighs> it's not that difficult to use, bro. Really. It's, uh, you know... This is a new one. My old one broke, and it was out of commission for a while. And then one day, Rachel was like, you know what? You need a new one of those. You, without your torch, you lose some of your mojo. And she said, what is it called? And I told her, and she found it online and ordered it for me. Pretty cool, huh? The Hero's Journey. My Hero's Journey has been very haphazard. <laughs> continues to be. Has and continues to be very haphazard. I keep going back to the Fool. You're supposed to proceed forward from the, the Fool. Yes, Pokemon is a kind of anime. It's an example of an anime. It's I wouldn't call it a very good anime. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, it's it's kind of fun. To, I, I used to watch it, the English dub of, of Pokemon with Delilah when she was little. And uh, I enjoyed it. I, I mostly enjoyed the hilariousness of Brock and the way he talked to... Um, the nurse joys and stuff. It's where I came up with or derived the expression I still use to this day when I'm talking to the cat or Rachel. Uh, I'll say, uh, you're constantly re-astonishing me with your beauty again for the first time forever. <laughs> not, not that uh, not that Brock said that exactly, but he always was saying stupid shit like that. Oh, nurse joy. Your beauty is is dazzling me beyond belief, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, Pokemon and Digimon are both kids shows. Most anime is not that dumb, you know? <laughs> Sophomoric is probably the best word for it. Uh, I don't think that's what you meant to write there. <laughs> like OGMN, sophomore, but it's a good word to use for 
uh, Digimon and Pokemon. My stepdad said to my mom, there's something on her face. Then we revealed she had beautiful all over it. Oh, that's that's so that's so cute. That's so cute. So Shomuru. Yeah, autocorrect. Um I actually haven't watched much in the in Yaisha, however you say that. I've watched a few episodes of of it, but um Oh, you were you watched PBS and Veggie Tales, huh? Were your parents Christians or intellectuals or both? <laughs> I, I kind of had a similar relationship with TV when I was a kid. My parents didn't like me watching very much TV. It wasn't like not allowed, but if I watched TV for very long, I was shooed outside to go play. Uh, I, you know, where's his mom? He's talking about an anime that I actually haven't watched very much of. I'm familiar with it a little bit. Um, but, uh, so I don't, I don't know what to say about, about those characters, that character. Inuyasha. Yeah. Um, you know, I just finished uh, Hajime no no Ippo. Well, not quite. I've got three episodes left in the second run of it, which is called the first one's called The Fighting. The second one's called The Rising. Anyway, um, so that was a very good show. The Rising is really, really quite good. Quite entertaining, um, and yeah, I mean, generally, that's that's the Japanese favorite kind of villain is well dressed, cold, calculated, competent. Uh, occasionally, they have crazy villains as well, but. Um, It's like the the typical lesson learned is that you need to you need to have other people that are precious to you and precious things to protect or else you lose your soul, you know. I never watched Veggie Tales. You like the grit and the grimy art style of old Hajime no Naipo more? Well, I, I liked watching the the old one in part because um it's so it's so representative of its time period. Everybody's using VHS tapes and newspapers to accomplish things and uh kind of reminds me of you know the eighties. Um, but at the moment, I'm kind of at a, at a lull in my anime. I've, I've burned through everything that really is dramatically, uh, I'll check it out. That sounds interesting. That sounds like something I might want to watch. The YouTube documentary on Veggie Tales Company. I have not yet tried Steins Gate. I've I've heard conflicting things about it. I've heard it's great and you'll like it. I've heard it's confusing and gets it gets like too inception y. Uh, I would suggest the thing that I always 
recommend and people go, you mean Steins Gate? Which is, I, I like to recommend Gate, G-A-T-E, all capitals with periods in between them. It's, uh, it's a show that is one of my favorite ever animes because it's the concept that you always kind of wanted to see, which is what would happen if we went back to the Middle Ages with modern weapons and fought against armies of people on, on horseback with swords and stuff. <laughs> so it's like, the thing I love about Gate is the beginning of it, like this, by the second episode or third episode, they're slaughtering 100,000 people who are charging mindlessly up this hill into artillery on horseback and stuff. It's it's just like <laughs> I like how honest it is, you know? Like, well, you guys shouldn't have invaded us because now here we are, and uh if you we're not gonna attack you if you keep attacking our camp, then we're just gonna mow you down. And then like, you know, they have dragons, but the Japanese attack helicopters <laughs> just Make short work of them. <laughs> uh, it's also very much a a sort of model UN peacekeeping force thing. So it's it's a really interesting. You couldn't finish season two. At the very end of season two, it gets it gets boring. Yeah, it's it's like an ad for a, a idealized UN peacekeeping force uh, civilizing a a swords and dragons world, which it's it's really fun. I really enjoyed it. As far as the tri type thing goes, I. If you don't know your dry type, you just got to answer these three questions. How do you know you don't need to be ashamed of yourself in general? Is it because your achievements? Is it because you're so helpful? Or is it because you're a rebel and fuck those people? You don't need those their approval anyway. And if the answer is achievement, then you're a three somewhere in your tie type, fry type. If the answer is help, helpful, you're a two. If the answer is rebel, you're a four. Okay, so you're a four somewhere in your tri type. Now let's figure out the other two numbers in your tri type. When you're scared of something, for example, there's a, a, a looming deadline that is, is stressing you out, maybe, or um, you're, you're sketched out because Maybe a relative's gone to get a diagnosis and you're worried about how it's going to turn out or something. Do you, number one, your number five, do you um, try to research as much about it as you can and know about it as much about it as you can until you're not scared about it anymore? Six, do you retreat to your nest and sort of build up your defenses and check your stockpiles and try to weather the storm? Or seven, do you stick your head in the sand and pretend Na, 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 na. I don't know about that. I'm not thinking about that. This is how I always ask it. <laughs> this is all. Um, so if your answer to that is going to be a five or six or a seven. Um, if it's the first one, it's five. Second one is six, third one is seven. So, okay, so you're probably a five and a four in your tri type. Now, the last one. If somebody is uh, coming at you with, with beef, like, hey, that was my parking space. You stole it. Are you going to come back at them with, beef back like the fuck it was this is my parking space or 
Are you going to appease and say, okay, okay, you know what? I don't need this bargain space. Fine, take it. I'll just move my car to this bargain space over there. Or are you going to go, well, actually, I was here first, and so it's my parking space. And they go, the fuck it is. You go, you know what? I'm done with you. I walk away. Which are you most likely to do if that situation were to occur? Which are you most likely to do if that situation were to occur? That'll tell you an eight, a nine, or a one. Okay, so four, five, one. That's very, that's very uh, German of you <laughs> or something like, I don't know. It seems like four, five, one is very, meh, meh, meh. let me see. Uh, let me see what the tri type is. So which one, the next question then, Ike, is which of those questions was easiest to answer? Which was second easiest to answer, and which was third easiest to answer? So, was it easiest to answer the question about how do you know you don't need to be ashamed of yourself? Was it easier to answer the question, what do you do when you're scared? Or was it easiest to answer the question, how do you react to beef? Okay. So you're four first. And then which of, which of the other two questions was easier to answer? And then I'll tell you what your precise tri-type name is. So you're either a 451 or a 415. Okay, so you're a four five one. Let's see what tri type that is. All right. Four, five, one. The refiner. Introspective, individualistic, reserved, rational, scientific, motivating by searching, collating, and teaching meaningful information. Uh, SPSO. So I don't know if these SPSOs are right or not, but um, according to this thing, if you're four, five, one, you're most likely to be uh, self-preserving first and then social and last SX. So if that's right, I what that means is you don't, you don't, um, you don't see yourself as a part of a two person relationship, really. Even if you're in one, you see, you see the two parties as being first and foremost autonomous individuals and that, um, and that to the extent that you are part of a couple, you would then, that would be subsumed by your self-interests and your social interests. So it'd be important for you maybe somewhat to go show up as a couple someplace, but. Well, SX, SOSP, SP just means basically you go through, through life seeing yourself as a solo operator. Um, and that's your most natural state of being. You're not, you might be in a relationship, but it's, you're in one of those kind of couples where they have totally independent finances and, and they split the bills on things and stuff like that, you know? Um, and then if you're, if you're SO, your relationship is secondary to the social network. I was in a relationship with an SO person, my second wife, and I got to experience what that's like it really bothered her that I didn't want to go do a bunch of stupid family barbecues and stuff like that with her family, with her big family, you know? So, uh, that was a big problem for her. And we ended up getting divorced mostly over that. I wasn't SO enough. 
I was too SX. A relationship is supposed to be about me and the other person, not about the group or about just me. I'm SX. Rachel's also SX. So, yeah. Like I said, you're, you're of the 162 tri types, yours is called the refiner. Mine is called the messenger, I believe. I'm seven, eight, four. The messenger. Now, Rain, I understand what you're saying. You don't like an Ebrom. You think it's fundamentally arbitrary. Well, it's it's only making really taxonomical claims. It's just saying people tend to. I, I I agree. There's no grounded justification for it other than observation, but observationally, it seems pretty a pretty good taxonomy. You know, if you don't if you don't if you acknowledge that it's not trying to be a model, in other words, it's not trying to actually. Um, It's not trying to actually like provide mechanisms, really. It just says this is sort of implicit to people. Then the limited scope of its claims makes it, I think, a meaningful way to at least taxonomy something that cognitive functions doesn't cover. I'm a Gemini moon with a Capricorn tune and Aquarius schooner in the bay. You got four, five, eight, the scholar. Ah, yeah. If you want to, if you want to know what exactly your thing is, because uh, it's easy to find a list of twenty-seven names, but if you want to find a list of all one hundred and sixty-two, then. I will put the link here. This is where I always go to find this. I keep going back to the same site. I should bookmark it, actually. But the way I get to it is the same every time I Google Curve Surfer Tri-Type, and it'll, that, that pops up, that link. <coughs> that has all 162 different Tri-Type names. So, like, because I'm a... If you, if you look at uh, Catherine Favre... She says there are 27 tri-types, basically, that there are uh, okay. I will uh, I will check it out and and maybe try to fix the audio. The problem with live stream songs is the audio is absolutely fucking garbage. And it I it's like even when, like last night, I thought I really felt like I played those last couple songs really well. I wanted to listen to them, and I did. And I could tell I played them well by listening to them. But at the end of the day, the the shitty audio quality makes me go ah. Well, but emotions. Emotions aren't, I mean, I think, it's a, I think it's a neat symmetrical model, really, isn't it? The, the thing you would take exception to is, well, why fear, shame, and anger? Why not envy? Why not... Uh, I mean, I, I agree with you in that regard that the initial three emotions don't really have, they only observationally seem true after the fact, not before, right? They don't seem to be observed so much as proved to be observationally consistent over time. 
But even then, it's hard to say because you're dealing with emotions. So I get what you're saying that it doesn't it doesn't do what you want it to do. But um, I I can manage. I can fix the audio. I I know perfectly well how to fix the audio on my end every time I live stream. I used to live stream with the software. And then, uh, and then, um, and I know how to fix the audio, right, that I have as best I can right now. It's just that since I'm not recording it locally, all I have of it is the the end product video where it's gone through the various compressions and stuff that YouTube does when you stream this way. If I streamed via the software, then you'd get a much better sounding audio stream because there's like a delay, so it doesn't have to uh, compress it so much in order to do it all in real time like it does with this. Yeah, but we can't really do that, Rain. I mean, I think if we, we can make the claim that those are the three main emotions of which all other emotions are subsets. And I think it's a fairly, fairly good enough claim. Uh, I just can't really support it, right? Like, well, how do you prove that? Well, the thing is, knowledge is knowledge unique in what sense? Oh, what happens when a knower can't know? They try to know. Well, I mean, this is the thing. I'm an SI knower, so I began with my experience of watching Rachel deal with the fact that she didn't know what she needed to know to finish all of her dress dealings, which is whether her dress dealt looked like a bridesmaid's dress. And as an NE dom, I said, well, wait till tomorrow until you find out and then worry about it because you can't, there's no point in NE now until you know the piece of information. For an any person, I'm perfectly, as an any person, I'm perfectly happy not knowing and saying, well, we'll have to wait and any more about this later. That's one of the strengths of being an any dom, I think. Um, is you have a good relationship with not knowing things. So, you could say then that uh, knowers have a good relationship with not doing things uh, or not ideating, depending on what kind of knower they are, right? Like uh, an NI knower is going to have not necessarily a good relationship with executing and a... Uh, so if you're 479, then you are... I'm going to spin on the next page. Yeah, I'm going to spin on the next page. Four seven nine, the gentle spirit. Okay, so if you're four seven nine specifically, you are the etherealist, creative, intuitive, magical, and imaginative, wispy, ethereal, and soft spoken, 
but fluid and with fluid but brittle sense of self. Four ring five SP. So you are supposed to be self preserving. Does that mean that in your relationship you uh, you keep up robust boundaries? Like, hey, it's your turn to pay for dinner. The nine seven four is called the self doubter. <laughs> That's it, it was sexy, the self doubter. You've got all these names, right? The etherealist, the gentle healer, the bard, the gentle positivist, the nostalgist. The self doubter. <laughs> oh, I'm the self doubter. God. Oh, I'm the curve surfer. That's right. I'm not the. Uh... So this the four seven eight is called the messenger type, right? The four set the four seven eight is the intense individualist. Four eight seven the attention seeker. 748, the originator. 784, the curve surfer. Mine says direct, original, independent, creative, moody, nonconformist, powerful, original, visionary. Seven wing eight, SX. Well, that's like, I don't know. Um, right on the money. More right on the money than any of the other ones. I was surprised when I saw this. It was like, huh. Yeah, that's that's just, I definitely sound like like this. I mean, you could say the attention seeker craves attention and affirmation, makes demands on themselves, it needs to be seen by others as highly original, unique. Uh. But I'm definitely a seven first. Because at the end of the day, I like to play. At the end of the day, I like to play. I bury my head in the sand and say, hey, tomorrow's not going to come my way. I'm going to bury my head in the sand. You don't know your S type. 269. Oh, you're not saying meme, meme. You're saying me, 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 me. Five, nine, four. Okay, five, nine, four. Here it is. No. Yes, here it is. So, in general, four, five, nine is called the contemplative, but five, nine, four is called the imaginative loner. Modest, discreet, relaxed, and casual, hiding deep in a realm. Fantastical, imaginative, passive with bohemian charm. Five wing four, self preserving. So, according to this, you're not particularly relationship y. Um, does that sound like you? Are you an imaginative loner? <laughs> uh, no, you, got, you just got to take my Enneagram test that I already gave, XI. You know, it's, uh, or she, uh, I already said it before. I don't want to say the whole thing again. Re rewind a bit and let, take my Enneagram test. Find it. Where, where was it when I Enneagram tested, uh, Ike? Um... Well, I didn't say anything about that. It said modest, discreet, relaxed, and casual, hiding deep in a realm. Well, fantastical, imaginative. So you're saying 
I'm not an INTP, I'm an ISTP. Maybe you're a uh, peace seeker, withdrawn, intellectual peace seeker, abhors conflict, keeps own company, depth of thought and emotion. Would you like to keep some peace? Would you like to keep a piece of peace? Would you like a plate of peas with your piece of peace? And then say please to me some more peas with my piece of peace. Would you like that? Peace seeker? Peace seeker missiles. 259. 259. Yeah, I have a two five. I have a seven. Yes, <laughs> two five nine. There's never been really any doubt about that. I I can tell right away I was a seven. <laughs> I I it I didn't unlike ENTP. I didn't happen upon my correct tritype immediately. At first, I thought I was a uh, seven three eight because at the time I was objectively achieving a lot of success. But um, isn't that a funny name? Peace Seeker Missiles. <laughs> Why don't I just call them War Making Missiles? That'd be a more accurate name, right? Why are we worried about what they're seeking? I don't think these missiles are really seeking anything, but certainly if they are, it's not peace. Uh, it's blowing something up, right? Oh, okay, Rain. I don't know what type you are. If I ever type you, I don't think I have. So 259, you said? Let's see. 259. 259 is the information expert. Helper who needs to impart information whilst keeping a peaceful countenance and environment. Wants to fit in, follow the acknowledged rules, and help out. 2 wing one SOSP. That's what 259 says. Combines the helpfulness of the two, the wisdom of the five, and the peacefulness of the nine. Anybody else want me to read their tri-type thing? Show in E. Here it is. It was right there the whole time. What do you want me to do, Black Knight? Say waka waka waka? <laughs> Show any. Okay. Um, my extroverted intuition tends to be fairly playful. So if you were to say show an E, I start to think of rhymes like mowing me. To show an E, I'd mowing, I'm mowing me lawn in a pirate style. Arg. You know, you were thinking how to do holograms like this. If you move your hands really fast, you can make a shape and the blur of your hands create a hologram in that fashion. There, that's an extra intuition. I just came up with a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant idea. Hand holograms. It's the next craze. It's the next big craze. On extroverted intuition, Tends to show when I make up stuff on the guitar as well on the fly. Mm. Extroverted intuition doesn't have to reject 
Everything that's simple, good and true, if it wants to be the best. Contrary to that, indeed, it needs to look into introverted intuition to find the truth. People who use too much activated intuition try to fix too many words in a line and they get stuck and they go off and they can't find their way out of the line. People who use too much activated intuition, they will sometimes make unconsciously or intentionally, I mean different kind of things rather than intuitive melodies. So they'll try to think something very strange, something out of key, out of range. Something just to make it different than before. Of course, instead, one has to keep inside one's head that it's burned intuition provides everything that's good. So, gotta find the truth inside this song for Sue's other. Why's your extroverted intuitions fail you? In other words, you can't have a stew that's none of a pepper and chew, and you've got to have some meat and vegetables instead. That'll bring me to the end of this demonstration of the extra version of the intuition. You have hereby watched it. I hope you're satisfied. There you go. Demonstration complete. Plump plock plops popped purple pockets properly. So true. I don't remember the last time I've heard such a true sentence as Rain's sentence. Plump plucked plops popped purple pockets properly before Paul's passive pawn pretended pointedly pursuing persimmons. Poignantly. Thank you. Thank you, Boba Fett. Poignantly, indeed. <laughs> it was a very poignant persimmons pursuit. I mean, aren't all persimmon pursuits fairly poignant? I think so. Pursue My Persimmon is uh, a good song to be the new, like, my milkshakes bring all the boys to the yard. I'd be like, pursue my persimmons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My persimmons are great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pursue my persimmons. <laughs> That's the new My Milkshake Brings All the Boys to the Yard. Thank you, everybody, for your kind words. These live chats are fun and informative. That's what I, you know, I like to hear that's, that's what I would like to, that's the message I'd like to, to, uh, to convey to the world. These live chats are fun and informative when I'm in a good mood. When I'm in a bad mood, they can get quite contentious. <laughs> Bundled Bumbles Bum Block Bottle Broth Buddies. Bundled Bumbles Bum Block Bottled Broth Buddies. I don't think bottled is a word, but bottled is with two T's. These live chats are full of subatomic meow. <laughs> they are. 
So if you're not getting enough Sabaton McMahon in your diet, then uh, this is the place to be. I watched this interesting show last night called um, Lost Worlds or something like that with Albert Lynn. And there's this guy, he went to uh, the site in China where they had the terracotta army. The thing you may not know about that site in China where they had the terracotta army, which I didn't know and I learned I found quite interesting, is that there's a mountain in the middle of the terracotta army that hasn't been excavated. That's the actual tomb. And part of the reason why it hasn't been excavated is because there's extremely high levels of mercury there, which supports the general myth that when this guy died, there were rivers of mercury in his tomb um, that flowed around uh, in the shape of the rivers of China. So, <laughs> you know what? That should we could add that to our boxing match, Winston Small. I like that idea. We it we could add in between rounds. We have an extended round break of a minute, in which we each get to whiteboard our interpretation of what happened in the previous round. Yeah. Well, don't even get me started about Mia yet uncollapsed from superposition. I mean, you start talking to me about that, we'll be here all day. Um, I wish it would. I don't think CS Joe's going to take me up on it. Uh, it it's, the only way he would is if there was a groundswell of. of effort within his audience to make it happen, you know, then maybe if a lot of people in, who actually regularly watched him and he, he considered allies started saying, do it, dude, you're going to beat him up. He's an old man. Then, you know, maybe he, he makes some money. You know, after all, I, I learned last night, apparently it's true that Logan Paul is is boxing Floyd Mayweather Jr. All right, what the? I guess it just goes to show you, well, just dollar dollar bills, no danger to Floyd Mayweather Jr. at all. And for Logan Paul, he can just get beat up on, you know? He can just get beat up on by a small middle-aged man. You know, the sweet science will be on full display in that boxing match as um, I mean, I'm assuming C.S. Joseph would have the advantage in the boxing match. Um, why? I'm 50 years old. I smoke a pack a day, not to mention all the bong riffs, and I get no exercise. And I, if he were to accept it, I would train from that moment until it started. I would definitely... Uh, It depends where you go. You can get sanctioned some random place, right? You just got to go to the right place. Oh, it turns out North Dakota is willing to sanction us, you know, right? We might have to, we might have to take a, a test to show that we 
you know, the basics or something. It might be a, mo a little more complicated than we want to engage in, I guess, but I disagree with you that we couldn't get sanctioned. That it just might require a little bit of, well, okay, but I mean, I get, what I also said was I'm open to a lot of different possible terms and uh, we can negotiate those. I'm, I'm happy to, to agree to any reasonable terms, basically. Um, so I propose going to him as, as a way of showing that I'm willing to figure out the legwork here. If, if in fact it turns out wherever he lives is not a good place. And then at that point, the conversation started, right? I not, I, I don't need to know very much about exactly how I'm going to make this happen until I get confirmation that he's down for me to, to make it happen. Right. So I agree, it'll probably be harder than I expect to make happen if he were to agree to it. But nevertheless, it would be significant enough of uh, a thing that I'd figure out how to make it happen one way or the other. Um, I mean, the thing is this, we have precedent of, of YouTubers getting sanctioned to box and boxing each other. There is some way they did it, right? So why can't we do that? Whatever that is. It might take a little bit of effort, but I don't see why we can't do it. Two ways about it. Figure it out first or on the fly. Which functions do that? Well, I mean, the thing is, I believe as an NE DOM, I've got the correct perception of, of the extroverted intuitions aspects of this. So in other words, before I bother devoting any actual TE or TI into the matter, really, I need to see that I have somebody who's willing to cooperate. Um, if I don't have somebody who's willing to cooperate with me for something that's mutually beneficial, then there's no point in putting any further attention into it. So I, until, until I know he's willing to cooperate, it's just a pitch to to get him to talk to me, basically, about it. Once once we get there, I'll figure it out. If it turned out, after all, that it was so difficult um, that it I couldn't make it happen, well, then I'd, I'd deal with that at that point, you know. But uh, I, I'm just trying to get step one done before I bother step two. <laughs> Eric, do you not like THC vape? Uh, I don't like it. And I don't typically ever get it. It's, I mean, the thing about, about concentrates, marijuana accomplishes its impacts by what's called the ensemble effect. In other words, the thing with the highest THC doesn't necessarily get you the highest. So like you'll, you'll see the test results on weed if you go to white market stores, what they're testing at in terms of their THC percentage. The higher number is not necessarily more stony. It's, it's an ensemble effect of various cannabinoids and other chemicals in marijuana they create the effect and it differs depending on the ensemble of different chemicals. So when you get a concentrate, you're losing some of that ensemble effect. Even if you are concentrating some of the elements, it it's, uh, I don't know. I, I like adding concentrate to bong rips rather than um, smoking it by itself are all cognitive functions improvable well the thing is it's it's uh, well i mean it'd be silly to plan for something that he that he'd never do though 
right? I have to find out that he's down for me to, he's down that such that doing the work is worth it. There's no reason to do any work until I know if he's down. I've never been able to actually speak to the guy as he doesn't want to talk to me. And uh, so uh, that's just how it is. Uh, you, you could argue that, but I mean, how can I be serious about a two person plan by myself? You know? Okay, well, uh, but see, my pitch right here is, would you like, would you be, but I mean, the thing is, what you're basically saying is, before I ask a woman to marry me, I should have set up all the things ready for if she says yes. That's incredibly dumb. Because you don't know if she's going to say yes. She might say no. And then you've invested all of that energy into preparing for what would happen if she said yes before you knew what that was. Why not? I'm not asking him to invest in something, right? That's why I made that very clear. It would be non-analogous if I were asking him to invest in something. Like, if I were saying, um, okay, I want you to put money and time into this, then he'd say, well, you want me to put money and time into this, then you better show me some mana. I don't want him to put money and time into this. I want him to indicate to me whether he's willing to consider putting money and time into this or just time or I'll, or whether it's worth my time to put money and time into it, right? So the thing is, Gen X, you're not, you're not considering both people's time as being of any value at all. I'm, I'm treating him like an equal human being, saying I'm willing to take on the bulk of this project if you're willing to do your part in it. But um, I'm not going to take on any of the project until I find out whether you're willing to, right? You're saying before he's even willing to express whether he's willing to me, that I need to have done more? That's kind of crazy, right? I'm just trying to find out if he's willing to, if, if he's, if he's in theory willing to box me, you know, then, then I can do some planning, right? If, and but if if it's like we need to agree on that basic concept before anything else happens, that's basic common sense. Basic common sense. You don't put effort into a big plan with Joe until you know that Joe's in on the plan with you, right? It's just basic basic common sense. You don't plan a big picnic with Mary. Before asking her if she wants to go on a picnic with you, you find out, yes, you're going on a picnic. Then you begin planning the picnic. That's just basic common sense. You have some general concepts about the picnic. But, you know, if the girl's like, well, how... Uh, how much have you prepared for the picnic? Well, I mean, so so we are going on the picnic? Well, I'm not answering that yet. I want to know how much you've prepared for going on the picnic before asking me if I wanted to go on a picnic. And uh, I'd say, well, I mean, if we're not going on a picnic, you don't need to know that information, right? Maybe, maybe if, you, if you're going to say no, maybe I don't want to share with you how much time and energy I've already wasted into this picnic that we're not going to go on. So why don't you at least spare me my dignity and just tell me whether you're going to go on the picnic rather than expecting me to demonstrate that I've planned for the picnic ahead of time. I don't doubt she is just going to beat me. I, 
Wh who? Why does everybody think that I insist that I necessarily think I can beat CSU in a boxing match? Just because I would like to get in the boxing match with CSU doesn't mean I think necessarily think I'm going to win. You know, I'll give it my best shot. I'd like to win. I, you know, yes, I accept the fact that I'm probably an underdog. You know. But I, I'm going to go in as confident as I can if it were to occur and, you know, try to try to win. I agree, Rain, that C.S. Joseph's not interested in and boxing me. It's obvious since he's given me no reply. Um, so, I mean, again, to sell something to somebody, first you need to establish that they're willing to hear you or talk to you at all, right? Remember, you're saying, you need to prepare to sell to somebody. But before I can prepare to sell something, I'm going to go sell to Joe. I have to know that Joe's going to let me in when I knock on the door. And you're saying, well, the quality of the presentation you bring. He didn't, I need to know he's going to see the presentation, right? How much effort do I want to put into a presentation that I'm not sure anybody's going to be willing to look at? Okay, so then the long shot was best executed the way I executed it without a lot of effort ahead of time. If it is a long shot, fine. You don't want to put a shit ton of effort and money into a long shot. After all, it's high, it's, uh, it's low risk, high reward is what you're going for, right? So low risk, I throw it out there as an idea, see if I get a bite. High reward if I do. What you're saying is no, no, no. You want high risk. You want to turn that into high risk, high risk, same high reward. That's dumb. That, that may say that to you that I don't really want it, but of course, Genexi, I don't want it under those terms. You're right. If in fact I have to jump through a bunch of hoops and and beg and plead and send him flowers and stuff in order to in order to get a reply, then I don't want it that badly. You're right. There are limits to how badly I want to box him. That's true. And that's good. So, you know, it's a, I, I did it the smart way. I took the low risk, zero risk, high reward angle, rather than generating a lot of risk speculatively that may not ever even be seen. I mean, you're at this point, you're not listening to me, right? It, it Trying harder does not mean you're necessarily going to do better at making big money. It depends what you're trying. So a much smarter way is to do things that are low risk, high reward, rather than high risk, same reward. Okay? Those are the choices. Remember, you're not asking me. It's, you're, that's entirely speculative, Genexial. That's entirely speculative. Remember, he has to see my presentation to be impressed by it. So the idea that increases your odds is speculative on something we do not know, which is whether he will even be willing to look at it. So, no, absolutely wrong. Not remotely close to worth it. Um, well, I mean, so you're saying book a hall and stuff and get it all set up and then ask him? I you know, when he won't answer me 
what, shouldn't I, by at this point, assume his lack of response is a no? And now you're saying, or you're, or you're just playing Captain Hindsight, that if I had put a bunch of money into it before mentioning it to him or anybody else, then he would have taken me seriously? I mean, that's awfully crazy speculative nonsense, right? I mean, that's called stupid capitalism. That You're not explaining capitalism. You're explaining how to lose money. You're explaining how to lose a lot of money on a, on a whisper in a dream. That's not smart. That's not good capitalism. So can I get my non-refundable deposit back now that I still got no answer from, from C.S. Joseph? I was sure that was going to convince him. No, he's laughing as I lose that $700 non-refundable deposit? Oh, fuck. Yeah, that's that's not capitalism, Genexial. That's just straight up stupidity. You're the one who said to show him I'm serious. Amount of money equals effort. You're the one who said that. I made him a video. I put it in the title, his name, everything, you know. It'll get to him. Somebody will mention it to him, I'm sure. I'm sure somebody already has. It's the best I can do. It's the most I want to invest into the possibility. I knew it was a long shot. I didn't think he was going to say yes, really. But I was hopeful because I framed it as, hey, look, this is just a simple practical benefit for both of us. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Well, I agree, Gen Axio, once, once, once we know what we need to know, though, right? It would be stupid to act as though we knew that C.S. Joseph was going to say yes before we know that. Okay? That's dumb. We don't want to do that. That's being dumb. So it's like everybody wants to critique here at the moment. Well, not everybody, but some people that maybe I didn't put enough effort into getting him to take me seriously on the thing. Well, then to me, I just served him up a softball. All he needs to do is call my bluff then. If in fact my lack of my lack of pre-work makes me not to be taken seriously, then CS Joseph should call my bluff. Right? I mean, it's a no-lose situation for him then. If he's convinced I'm not serious, then it totally benefits him to accept my offer. And make me look like a laughing stock. Right? Well, I mean, you're you're not just riffing with me. You're saying that I needed to do stuff before I knew what I needed to know in order to be taken seriously. And I'm saying that's wrong. And then you describe that as you explaining capitalism, even though you're the commie, the self-described commie here. I said, that's not describing capitalism. That is dumb. Right? That's the correct thing to say about that. So, yeah. You pissed me off a little bit. And I referred to a couple things as dumb and stupid. I did. I did that. I may not be proud of it, but I'm not exactly ashamed of it either. Right, Freddy Forgiato. So we made it a long shot. <sighs> trying to lighten the mood. Well, you know what you're doing, Jack Zero? Oh, you're trying to lighten the mood. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I misread that. I thought you were trying to lighten the mood. You were trying to lighten the mood. Well, you are making it later. I think you're the one responsible for the passage of time, right? Okay, I'm sorry I said dumb and stupid. God. 
My bad. That was non-civil discourse on my part. God damn it. Oh, well. You know, part of everyday life is an abundant helping of failure. Thank you, Winston's mom. I wish everybody had that attitude. For me, a large part of the fun was watching host Eric that day and a few days later talk about it. I don't need to see the boxing match. Host Eric will move on creatively when it happens cool. Exactly. Exactly. Just throw seeds out there. You're like, but at least put some effort into planting them a little bit. Fair enough critique. But I'm like, no, I'm throwing seeds. That's my technique. I'm not planning them, I'm throwing them. Some of them will grow, maybe. That's my technique. May not be much of a technique. Maybe more haphazard laziness. Uh, maybe it's just self-indulgent wankery. But, you know, that's how I roll. I'm throwing seeds without pigeons. Well, you know, hey, but I want to point something out, Sky Gear. If I'm throwing down some bird seeds in a place where there are no birds, let's say throwing down a pigeon seed for some non-pigeons, you know what may end up happening? Some pheasant may come by and go, oh, if none of the pigeons want to eat this seed, maybe I'll eat it. Maybe... Maybe uh, Pukoki will say, hey, Eric, I would like to box you. Maybe, uh, yeah, it's true, Gen X, because it's an absolute value for me. <sighs> um, you know, maybe... Maybe not Bukoki, but the person I was trying to say, um, who's that famous guy? Uh, PewDiePie. Maybe PewDiePie will see my video challenging C.S. Joseph to a fight, and PewDiePie will decide he wants to fight me. See what I'm saying? That's why it's good to throw seeds. You're not a famous enough YouTuber, Sky Gear. I need to box somebody who's a more famous YouTuber than me. That would be great if I could find somebody like super big and famous to box me. You're not nearly famous enough, Sky Gear. I'd box Lijo if Lijo wants to box. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to take that match, okay? I think I might get, get seriously injured in that match. I have no doubt that Marty Glenn would whoop my ass. I have zero doubt of that. Um, if it's not an absolute value, why does one feel so vulnerable when their fourth slot is exposed, attacked? Because you would like... For um, others to cut you slack in that area and or take over for you in that area. I do not. I will not box Taylor. No way. <laughs> no fucking way. <laughs> there is no way I'm going to box Taylor. I turned down that match. Why? Fear. That's why. I don't want to get hurt that badly. I will not box Taylor. Now, if Taylor had half a million subscribers, I would box Taylor.
I could not fight Mayweather. <laughs> Neither can Logan Paul. <sighs> Taylor's definitely T.I. Um, yeah, I would not fight him. <laughs> no. I mean, unless he had a half a million subscribers. I definitely box Frank James. If Frank James wants to box me, I will totally box Frank James. Pia, 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 pia. Or probably, I think I can beat Frank James. Who here thinks I can beat Frank James in a boxing match? Me, I think I can. Me. Who wants to see me box Frank James? Me. Me. I do. I want to see me box Frank James. You know what? I might be able to get an actual response from Frank James. I'm sure it'll be no, but he might do me the courtesy of answering. Um... And uh, that alone would be great if he were to just even leave a comment and say, no, I'm not going to box you. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I've talked about I could box Elijah Joe. I think Elijah Joe might kick my ass, but that's fine. I, you know, I, I'll survive. It's not like, you know. I'd be most scared of, of Taylor, the ones mentioned. I would not I would not feel like I had any chance to step into the ring with him. Um, having hung out with him and stuff, I, I just can tell you, I <laughs> no thank you. <laughs> He's got a certain like dangerous vibe about him. Um, I would not want to get into fight with him. Uh, Megan Lavoda? <laughs> I I box Megan Lavoda. You know what? I I try to avoid hitting her brows. <laughs> Just punch here, 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 here. No, not on the brow. I just couldn't. I couldn't bring myself to mess up those brows. You know, they're so perfect. Um. Okay. I will box Shannon and Dave as a tag team. They can tag in and out. Okay. You and Taylor or the fields? <laughs> Probably you and Taylor. <laughs> I would box Michelle Obama. I would totally box Michelle Obama. I think it would be a fairly even match. Probably. She seems a, like an athletic lady. <laughs> um. <laughs> the endless Curtis. I'd box the endless Curtis. Uh, who would win in a boxing match between the Endless Curtis and Frank James? I would be the big loser in that because why am I not in the boxing match instead of the Endless Curtis? Do you think Michelle Obama would beat me easy? Do you think you think Megan Lavota would beat me easy too? Who do you? Who do you think would be more likely to beat me in a boxing match? Megan Lavota or Lijo? That's what I want to know. Who would be more likely to beat me in a boxing match? Megan Lavota or Lijo? I think after this stream in just a little bit, I'm going to make a, a video. <laughs> I'm 50. I'm 50 years old. I'm going to make a video challenging a lot of different people all at once to boxing matches. <laughs> I'm going to say, listen, any of you people on this list who wants to box me, I'm down to box you, okay? We can, we can amateur box, which is uh, with headgear if you want. 
And then I think maybe it would be easier to get certified if we box with headgear, you know? You think Megan would be more likely to beat me up than Lijo? Okay, that's definitely um, that's definitely a good poll question. I put the poll question up right now. Who would be more likely to beat me in a boxing match? To beat host Eric in a boxing match? More likely defeat host Derek in a boxing match. I'm going to capitalize defeat so it's very clear. I'm just going to put two cho choices. Lijo and Megan. La Voda or La Voda? La Voda? I better check because I can't change it once I put it. Megan La Voda. Yes. Evie. EV 17, eight, almost 18,000 subscribers. Who's God Sod? I've never heard who God Sod is. That's a good poll question. I bet that'll get a lot of a lot of response. Freddie Forgiato is putting his money on. Why, Joe? <laughs> Megan says, Swift Eagle says, Megan looks like she played softball in high school. I agree. Megan could have been a softball girl. You know? She's got that bat swinging kind of... <clears throat> I, I, think, I think Megan would be a tougher takedown than Why, Joe? Just because of, of like, yeah, well, what Desert INTJ says, why well, just too skinny for boxing? I'm too skinny for boxing too. But um, a famous author is on both YouTube and Twitter. What's his, what's his sh spiel? What's his shtick? Thing is, I've been watching a lot of boxing, so I I have a a completely unwarranted confidence in my ability to box. <laughs> I, I've been watching a lot of it. <laughs> See, I totally know what I'm doing. I've been watching it and paying attention to how they do it, how they move around. God Saad has unfortunately entrenched himself within the right wing edgelord movement, a Saad affair. Genexio, I'm not really sure I can trust you when it comes to political depictions of other people. You are rather politically meow yourself, you know. But Dunning Kruger adjacent. He'd be easy to get riled up. He's a bit old like me. Hmm. That's a good suggestion, then. If he is perceived how Gen Xiel says, then it would be... Uh, it would be um, easy for me to to disagree with him about something, I'm sure. If he's a... If he's a uh... Okay, cool. Um, I'll take your word for it. Sorry for doubting start doubting the veracity of your political description. Uh, what's my... Do you want me to give up my secret? My secret weapons? I've got a number of signatures, okay? 
How many pounds is 80 kilograms? I'm 190 pounds. What weight class does that put me in? That's we're about the same weight, too. Look at that. <laughs> Interesting. We're the same weight and everything. So anyway, I've got a few signature moves, raw milk. First, I want to uh I'm gonna I'm gonna use Aoki's brilliant move from from Ipo, how do you mean Ipo? The look away. So we'll be standing there right looking at each other, right? And then I'll go like this. And the other person will turn their head and then I'll pow punch them. The look away. <laughs> also the frog punch. We get down really low. <coughs> <laughs> you jump up with both legs and punch him in the chin. Also, the Dempsey roll. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> I've also got, uh, let's see. No, I, I mean, I, I'm not anti-Semitic at all. It's a reasonable thing to get upset about. Um, however, I am sometimes uh, not happy with the Israelis. I could, I could correctly critique Israeli policy and that might get him accusing me of being anti-Semitic. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't get angry at postmodernism, Genexio? It's silly. It's like, let's deconstruct all the memes. Okay, why? What? Why? We don't know anymore. We deconstructed that meaning. Okay, you wankers. Anti-Semitism is not that big of a problem. But if you want to talk problems, well, then Bernie Sanders got a lot of them. I, is that a quote of me? <laughs> it could very easily be a quote of me. Oh, yeah. I agree with that. I agree with what I said. <laughs> I totally agree with what I said, but it doesn't mean I don't think that it's a bad idea to get upset about anti-Semitism when it does occur. I'm saying anti-Semitism is not that big of a problem. And I'm not saying it's not a problem at all or that it doesn't sometimes occur. If you have a specific specific instance of anti-Semitism that somebody wants to get upset about, fine. You know, I, I understand, like, instances of groupist bullshit are always irritating. Um, but I still agree with what I said then. Anti-Semitism is not that big of a problem. But if you want to talk about problems, well, Bernie Sanders got a lot of them. You know. Oh, was that from a, the original version of El Nino, my ass? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Forgot about that. Uh, oh, I need to get myself a coffee. And then I think I'm going to... Um, and I think I'm going to uh, probably stop this video pretty soon and 
make a video challenging various people <laughs> to box me. <laughs> I mean, I, maybe, maybe I should start with just a video encouraging Frank James to box me. Because, <laughs> boy, if I could get Frank James to box me, that would be fantastic. Just imagine, if you get Frank James to box you, you got his, his huge subscriber base, like all, like, especially interested in one big event. It's like how much a huge percentage of that subscriber base is going to tune into that um, fight, you know, whoever he fights, it doesn't matter who he fights, but fighting me makes sense because, you know, <laughs> I know we don't have any beef is the other thing. Piss pissed off or um, So, but if you just think about it for, Here's the other, here's the thing though. Here's why you could conceive of him maybe accepting it. Fourth slot SE and fifth slot any. It's it's just exactly the sort of thing that might appeal to Frank James as an INFJ. You never know, right? Um, he may be right now stuck in his NI going, God, I, I've got to find out, make something, some new content that he might be doing that. He might be looking for something to bust out of his NI prison at the moment. And maybe this is just the thing. If he doesn't want to do a boxing match, but he wants to do some sort of physical competition with me, that's not boxing. We could, we could have a pentathlon or something, you know, <laughs> like a, a, a race on foot, uh, like a pull-up contest. <laughs> um, gator wrestling. I don't really want to gator wrestle, but if he insists, I'd gator wrestle. I guess if it was small enough gator. But this big, <laughs> and it's a pretty small gator. <laughs> oh, if anybody were to challenge me to a boxing match, I would give them a very full and formal reply, for sure. I would say, uh, no, I'm not going to box you if I wasn't going to, and here's why. And the answer would almost certainly be one of two possible answers. One possible answer would be um, that uh, they're not famous enough. Um, and in which case, I would say, but if if you, at that point, I would go genexial route. But if you show me that you can make this shit happen and I don't really have to do anything, then I might be down. It's, it's still get good views and stuff. Uh, so that that's would be one possible answer. The other possible answer would be, no, I'm not going to box you because you look way too tough or I, I don't want to get hurt that badly. <laughs> um, I don't want to take on somebody who's a lot tougher than me uh, because I don't want to get injured very badly. I don't mind getting hurt. I don't want to get injured very badly. So... Um, you know, I don't want to take on a professional boxer. I don't want to get punched in the face by Mike Tyson, even at 50 years old. No, thank you. Mm. Right. Like I will not take on Marty Glenn. If you were, to, if you were to challenge me to box him, I would say, no, I'm not going to box you. I'll make explicitly clear why I'm quite sure you will kick my ass and I'm scared of you. I'm scared that you will hurt me in the process of doing so. And uh, I don't see enough benefit to boxing you to want to take that chance. But, again, if you can show me there's enough benefit to it, you know, 
I can turtle up for a round, maybe. See if I can get a couple of lucky blows in. I can get knocked out. It won't kill me. You know, I've been knocked out before. But yeah, I think I think Marty Glenn would cave my face in. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's why I won't fight him. Well, obviously, I don't think C.S. Joseph is as. I don't think C.S. Joseph is going to cave my face in. Even if C.S. Joseph were to beat me up a lot, get a lot of punches in, I don't think I'm going to have my orbital bone broken by him. You know, that's what it boils down to. I don't think I'm particularly fragile, but if someone packs a serious wallop, you can you can break bones easily enough. I, I would not be shocked in the boxing match if I got my nose broken again, which has been broken before in a fist fight. Um, so, you know, that's kind of goes with the territory, but, uh, I would, I wouldn't want any other injuries besides that. And I think Marty Glenn would injure me. Uh, I, I, um, would not talk smack pre, pre debates and I wouldn't talk smack pre fights either. Uh, I think I'd get very quiet probably be thinking about what I got to do. You know, I'd be shifted into SE mode, I guess. When you shift it into SE mode, talk's cheap. It just is. <laughs> you know, there, there ain't no ain't no denying it. But in my upcoming video challenging various people to box me. Um, you know, I will fight, I will box women. <laughs> I, I'm fine with that. Uh, assuming they're fairly tough women. I, I don't want to box, like, like I wouldn't box, I probably would not box Bukovi. <laughs> I would just be like, no, I, I don't want to beat you up. <laughs> I'd only box women that I think would would likely be be at least a good match for me or better than me. I wouldn't fight women that I thought would be easy to beat. <laughs> but I acknowledge the fact that there are plenty of women out there who kick my ass, and I don't want to deny them the opportunity to box me if they wanted to. And I feel like I probably uh, generally unless they're a professional uh, women's boxer, I think I'm probably not going to get my my orbital bone broken by uh, a woman or less likely to. Maybe that's being sexist. I don't know. <laughs> you know what, Winston's mom, I'll tell you what, I'm going to compromise with you. Instead of doing that, I'm going to put some boxing stuff on the green screen in the background, okay? So it's not just me sitting here in front of the green screen. How is that for a compromise? Uh, okay, so I'm going to call it a stream. It's been three full hours. Wow. And now I'm going to make my video about challenging the internet to boxing. <laughs> Goodbye. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Ike, for your donation. Appreciate it a lot.